So I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Primary Care Lecture Series. Um, the talk today is uh, cannabis, uh, the science of cannabis, um, and our lecturer is Dr. Abrams. He is uh, he is the chief of oncology, hematology and oncology at San Francisco General since 1983. He's been on the forefront of HIV/AIDS research and treatment. Um, he has uh, done some of the very important first research on HIV neuropathy and the use of cannabis um, in treating that. Um, and he continues to do uh, a lot of research in every uh, area of oncology and cannabis. Um, he's also currently the uh, uh, director of clinical programs at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine at UCSF Medical Center Mount Zion where he does integrative medical uh, consultations for cannabis patients, or for uh, um, cancer patients involving a multidisciplinary approach to uh, uh, dealing with that um, cancer. And so today uh, we have Dr. Abrams. I just want to give thanks to Fred Garner and the Society of Cannabis Clinicians for helping to uh, provide the food and, and support our, our speaker. Um, just want to give them a thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Orlando, and thank you, Fred. Uh, and it's nice to be here. I would like to talk a, a bit about the use of uh, marijuana as medicine. It's, it's an old medicine, and we're learning more uh, really how old it is, actually. We've felt that it's been in use uh, in China and the Indian subcontinent for thousands of years, but recently Ethan Russo published a uh, a paper uh, about a tomb that was found in in western China with a Caucasian shaman apparently buried with uh, quite a bit of female flowers of the cannabis plant. And it was still well preserved and they analyzed it and it is very much like cannabis that we have today. And the fact that it was only female flowers suggests that they knew that it was had medicinal qualities and they they speculate that it was used either as medicine or for divination. Uh, again, probably originating in China, then moving to the Indian subcontinent, cannabis was first introduced into Western medicine in the 1840s by W.B. O'Shaughnessy, who was a surgeon for the British East Indies Company. And while he was in India, he appreciated uh, many benefits of the use of uh, cannabis as medicine. Uh, it was ultimately reported to be Queen Elizabeth's uh, favorite treatment for her dysmenorrhea. The putative actions at the time were analgesic, sedative, anti-inflammatory, anti-spasmodic, and anti-convulsant. And in the early part of the 20th century in the US, many different drug companies had cannabis extract preparations. This one is from uh, Park Davis, uh, but also Eli Lilly, Wyeth, and Sharpen Dome also had their own uh, cannabis preparations. The interest, however, in the use of, of this whole plant compound as a medicine began to decrease in the early 1900s with the availability of agents that actually targeted just one of the indications for which uh, cannabis was recommended. And the real death knell uh, to the use of cannabis occurred in 1937 with the introduction of the so-called Marijuana Tax Act uh, by Harry Andlinger, uh, shown here. Harry Anslinger was a, a prohibitionist, and when prohibition ended, uh, he felt he needed something else to sort of champion. Uh, he was also a racist, and he was afraid that the use of cannabis uh, in Latin American and African American jazz musicians would lead to increased crime and mental health in the United States. So he, uh, who became the first uh, director of the Federal Narcotics Bureau, introduced uh, this legislation in 1937, which imposed a tax of a dollar an ounce for medical use and a hundred dollars an ounce for recreational use. And these were 1937 dollars, so this was not an insignificant tax. Now interestingly, the American Medical Association uh, stood virtually alone in opposing the Marijuana Tax Act uh, because number one, they believed any objective data regarding the harmful effects of cannabis were lacking and that the act would impede future clinical investigations, which it certainly did. Uh, Ultimately, cannabis, which is what the physicians were calling it at the time, as opposed to marijuana, was removed from the U.S. pharmacopoeia in 1942. Up until that time, however, physicians could write prescriptions for cannabis for patients. In 1942, also, the LaGuardia Commission issued its report, 
Fiorella LaGuardia, the mayor of New York, brought together a group of uh, scientists to investigate whether the claim that cannabis use would increase uh, mental illness and crime was valid. And in fact, they concluded that this was a safe and effective medicine and there was no evidence of increased crime and mental illness. Approximately every 10 years, a government uh, mandated investigation into cannabis as, as medicine uh, is put forth. The last one was in 1999, the Institute of Medicine report, Marijuana as Medicine. And they all basically come to the same conclusion that it's a useful medicine, uh, but they're largely ignored. In 1970, with the Controlled Substances Act, uh, cannabis got scheduled in so-called Schedule One. Schedule One drugs <clears throat> have a high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use. Schedule Two drugs, on the uh, contrary, are, are drugs that also have a high potential for abuse but have uh, an accepted medical use, and we could write for them with our controlled prescription pads. The substances that cannabis keeps company with in Schedule One are heroin, LSD, et cetera, and most recently, a GHB has been added. So when I first got interested in, in studying marijuana as a medicine, colleagues would say, gee, you know, Donald, the, what we do now is we don't smoke plants for medicine and we sort of isolate, you know, the active moiety and put it in a capsule and, you know, this, the Western pharmaceutically dominated paradigm of what a medicine is. And they said, well, how do you know what's working in this plant that has over 400 chemical compounds? And that you know, that's a plus and a minus. Actually, it was my interest in cannabis as medicine as I became a student of this and became so appreciative of the power of this plant as medicine that ultimately led me to basically change my career uh, by taking the two-year program in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona as a distance learning fellowship because I was so interested in plants as medicine uh, spurred on by uh, cannabis. And so now what I do is integrative medicine uh, with cancer patients. Uh, but again, in Chinese medicine, for example, uh, there are many herbs that are used still in their natural form. And if you extract a single active moiety from the whole stroma of the herb itself, uh, you take it out of its context and it could increase the toxicity and decrease the efficacy. So we know that the highest concentration of the bioactive compounds in cannabis is in the resin exuded from flowers of the female plants. And the main psychoactive component is delta-9 THC. But now it's felt that there are at least 70 other cannabinoid compounds that are identified in, in the plant itself. And delta-8 THC, for example, has been investigated by Raphael Machulam, a cannabis chemist uh, in Israel, uh, and it has been found to have good activity as an anti-emetic in children uh, with cancer receiving chemotherapy. Again, it's not present in our commercial uh, available Delta-9 preparation, but it is in the plant. Cannabidiol is something uh, that we'll hear uh, more about as time goes on, as cannabis therapeutics are advanced. But these are just uh, uh, names of some of the other uh, non-Delta-9 THC cannabinoids that may be present in the plant. And again, these secondary compounds may enhance the beneficial effects of THC and also reduce uh, some of the uh, adverse effects anxiety, the drying and the immune suppression, if there is any, uh, may be modulated by the other components. And those are just the cannabinoids, uh, but the terpenoids and flavonoids, which are present in the, in the plant, may also have uh, beneficial uh, clinical activities. So over the past 30 years, there has not been a lot of research done on marijuana as medicine because it's been you know, put in Schedule 1, and it's very difficult to do research. But many basic scientists have learned a lot about how cannabis works in the human body. And we now know that there are two receptors that have been identified, the CB1 receptor and the CB2. And these are coupled to G proteins and inhibit adenylocyclase. The central nervous system responses are predominantly mediated by the CB1 receptor, which has its largest concentration in the basal ganglion and cerebellum. And just to uh, point out that the CB1 receptor is one of those seven transmembrane receptors uh, that are so important in biological, biochemical, and molecular biology of functioning. And, and activation of the receptor causes uh, many different changes uh, that lead to differentiation and change in, in cell function. Uh, this is just an example in the deep orange in this rat brain. 
shows the highest concentration of the CB1 receptor. Cannabinoid receptors are present in every animal species down to sponges. And so recently we went to an international cannabinoid research society meeting which suggested cannabinoid receptors may be present in unicellular organisms. Now, you know, why would all these animals have cannabinoid receptors? They're not meant to be smoking marijuana. You know, I'll talk about that in a second. Let me just say that the CB2 receptor, I say it's not expressed in the brain, but again, at a recent meeting of the International uh, Cannabinoid Research Society, there is some suggestion that it may be expressed in the brain, but this receptor was originally described in the macrophages in the marginal zone of the spleen with the highest concentration in the peripheral blood in the B lymphocytes and natural killer cells, suggesting that this receptor may have something to do with immune response. So the receptor, why do all these animals and humans have these receptors? The answer is, like endorphins, we also make our own endogenous cannabinoids called the endocannabinoids. And the first one of these that was identified again by Raphael Matulam, the Israeli cannabinoid, uh, cannabinoid chemist, was called anandamide uh, from the Sanskrit word for bliss. And anandamide and the other endocannabinoids, most uh, convincingly 2AG, uh, those are the two endocannabinoids, they complex uh, with the cannabinoid receptor and then affect change in the cells. So why do we have endocannabinoids? You know, I don't think anybody knows, but the best lay uh, sort of explanation that I've read is by Michael Pollan, uh, who wrote a book called The Botany of Desire. And he describes four plants that we think we've mastered, but he suggests that the plants have mastered us to make them better. And he, he suggests that we have endocannabinoids to help us forget things. So while I'm sitting here talking to you, I'm not remembering the last time I saw Fred or, or where I parked my car at San Francisco Airport, or, you know, so I could forget. And then if we replace our endogenous cannabinoids with the plant cannabinoid or the phytocannabinoid by smoking or ingesting marijuana, we forget to forget. So everything becomes new wow. You know, like that. So, so that's uh, why we think we have endocannabinoids. Now, many pharmaceutical companies are now working on modulation of the endogenous cannabinoid system uh, via creating uh, agonists and antagonists for the receptors. And what we know about the functions of CB1, when the endocannabinoid or the plant cannabinoid uh, combines to the CB1 receptor, we think it impacts on appetite, immune function, muscle control, pain, intraocular pressure, cognition, emesis, neuroexcitability, reward mechanisms, and thermoregulation. Via the CB2 receptor, again, the, the receptor that's more commonly seen on cells of the immune system, we think that there may be effects on immune function, cell proliferation, certainly important to me as an oncologist, uh, inflammation and pain. So again, many, many pharmaceutical companies are now working to develop agonists or antagonists to CB1, CB2, looking to try to figure out how to increase or enhance or decrease the metabolism of the endocannabinoids, many different ways to modulate and manipulate the system to get physiologic and pharmacologic, pharmacologic effects. The cannabinoid that we're most used to in medicine is uh, dronabinol, uh, otherwise known, the generic name is, uh, I mean, the, the pharmaceutical name is Marinol. This is oral delta-9 THC, which was initially approved in 1986 for treatment of nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy. In 1992, the label was expanded on dronabinol to include uh, treatment of AIDS-related appetite loss. You guys are all too young to remember, but in 1992, uh, before we had effective antiretroviral drugs, the largest, second most common cause of death in people living with HIV after pneumocystis pneumonia was the AIDS wasting syndrome. These patients couldn't eat, they had fever, diarrhea, they lost weight, they became skeletal like concentration camp victims. The first drug that was approved for the treatment of, of this disorder was Megase. Uh, but the second drug was dronabinol. However, if you look at this advertisement carefully, because you need to have truth in advertising, 
you can see that in placebo-controlled studies, uh, dronabinol did not actually lead to an increase in weight, but it led to an increase in appetite in these patients with HIV. Uh, but it was approved uh, for political reasons, I think, mainly. And we started to give our patients in San Francisco and elsewhere with AIDS wasting syndrome, again, prior to the available and effective antiretroviral drugs, this oral THC. And the patients actually complained about it and said, you know, I don't like it. It takes a long time to work. You know, if I'm taking it to increase my appetite, the peak plasma concentration actually in research that we did occurs two and a half hours after it's taken by mouth. And it lasts for a long time with a terminal half-life of 20 to 30 hours. But what you get, if you look at the pharmacokinetics, you get a very slow rise to a low peak that lasts for a long time. And in addition, when taken by mouth, either dronabinol or cannabis products, so people who eat brownies, for example, when the delta-9 goes through the liver, the first pass metabolism, delta-9 THC is converted to an 11-hydroxy metabolite, which also is psychoactive. So people who take Marinol or eat brownies, for example, often say that they get more of an effect than a sedating effect, if you will, uh, than if they smoke. So when Marinol was released in 92, you know, very shortly thereafter in 94, this is a front cover from a, one of the old gay newspapers that no longer exists in San Francisco saying marijuana is good medicine because our patients just didn't like taking this pill. And what they're describing is really the benefit of the inhaled pharmacokinetics. When inhaled and taken rapidly into the bloodstream redistributed, first of all, a considerable amount of the dose is lost in smoke and destroyed by combustion, but the peak blood level occurs in 30 minutes and then rapidly comes down, a little bit like an IV bolus. The half-life is shorter and smaller amounts of this 11-hydroxy psychoactive metabolite are formed. So it is much easier to titrate the effect and much cleaner, if you will, uh, than when taken uh, by mouth. Now, in the 70s, research was done on marijuana and appetite stimulation. And what they did was they put a group of healthy controls in a room and had them smoke marijuana and gave them access ad lib to food. And they found that marijuana increased caloric intake, mainly in the form of between meal snacks, uh, fatty foods, and sweets. We called that the munchies in college when I went. But uh, now we've be become a little bit more sophisticated. And what we know about how this works is that anandamide, that endocannabinoid, in low concentrations in mice leads to a potent enhancement of appetite. The CB1 receptors are implicated in control of food intake via the lateral hypothalamus and the limbic system locations. CB1 knockout mice, those mice that don't have that receptor, eat less than wild type mates. So it's felt that the CB1 receptors are involved in the motivational reward aspects of eating. And the system may also be involved in suckling because mother's milk has high levels of the other endocannabinoid. And if you give mice just at birth an antagonist to the CB1 receptor that causes them to stop suckling and they die. So pharmaceutical companies said, uh-huh, let's make an antagonist to CB1 and give it to people to see if we can reduce weight in people who are obese who are eating because of their reward mechanism being stimulated through food. And in fact, this drug is licensed and approved now in Europe, uh, made by Sanofi called Ramonabant. Uh, the drug is not yet approved in the United States because one of the side effects of blocking your cannabinoid receptor is depression and suicide. So the FDA decided that it wasn't worth it to have people lose six kilograms on average is what it was uh, and have increased depression and suicide. <clears throat> Actually, one of my uh, basic science cannabinoid chemist colleagues uh, from Madrid, when we were talking about uh, this drug, said to me, would you take something that blocks your CB1 receptor? So I guess the answer is no. I think until we know a little bit more about this, uh, we probably shouldn't do it.
So how did I, uh, sort of a traditional oncologist working in HIV, get involved uh, in medical marijuana research in the first place? Well, in 1992, the International AIDS Conference in all places was held in Amsterdam. And I was in Amsterdam, and I'm not making any, any disclosures here, but I was in my hotel room looking at CNN, world news headlines, and Mary Rathbun uh, was being arrested. Mary was a 70-ish year old woman who was volunteer of the year for two years in a row at the AIDS clinic at San Francisco General Hospital. She would take our patients uh, to x-ray, drop their prescriptions off in the pharmacy, and she would bake brownies for her kids, as she called them, and she was known as Brownie Mary. And her brownies were spiked. And here I was in Amsterdam looking at Brownie Mary being arrested for baking brownies for AIDS patients in Sonoma County. And when I came back, there was a letter on the desk uh, addressed to the director of research in the AIDS program at San Francisco General, which I wasn't, but it found its way to my desk. The letter was from Rick Doblin, who is a Harvard uh, PhD in, uh, from the Harvard School of Government, interested in uh, drug policy reform. And the letter suggested that a clinical trial showing the benefits of marijuana in AIDS patients should come from Brownie Mary's institution, as if she were our dean. <laughs> so I said, okay, this sounded interesting. So I sent Rick Doblin our template for how to write a protocol for the Institutional Review Board, thinking since he's not an MD, I could sort of you know, tone him down and keep him away for a while. I said, send me a proposal in a week. He sent me a proposal to compare marijuana brownies to Marinol. And I said, gee, if we're going to do an eight-week study, we need a stable supply of, of drug, and I don't think brownies are going to last for eight weeks. So, so then, finally, in 1994, we submitted a proposal uh, to look at uh, three different strengths of inhaled THC versus dronabinol. Uh, but we couldn't get the marijuana from the federal government, the only legal source of marijuana. And they didn't think it was a very good study. They weren't happy about us giving marijuana to outpatients. So in 96, we submitted another study uh, to the government uh, saying we're going to do a much more elegant inpatient study in our general clinical research center. And again, uh, they didn't like it because our endpoint was, does marijuana have a medicinal benefit? 1997, it's interesting, I actually went to the Clinton inauguration, and I met with Alan Leshner, who at that time was head of NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and he explained to me that these first two requests never could be granted, because NIDA is the only legal source of marijuana for research in the country. And NIDA has a congressional mandate to study substances of abuse as substances of abuse. He said we're the National Institute on Drug Abuse, not for drug abuse. So we cannot give you marijuana to study to see if it has a medicinal benefit. So in 1997, a few things happened. The state of California voted to allow us to discuss with patients the use of marijuana, the Compassionate Use Act. Protease inhibitors became widely used in patients with HIV and they no longer developed the wasting syndrome. But they, there was a report of a patient dying because of a drug-drug interaction between protease inhibitors and ecstasy, a street drug. And so I looked and I found that in fact cytochrome P450, which is the key to metabolism of the protease inhibitors, also interacts with cannabinoids. So in 1997, understanding that I could not do a study looking at efficacy I proposed a study looking at the safety of marijuana in patients with HIV taking protease inhibitors to determine whether or not there may be an interaction between cannabis and protease inhibitors that would lead to either a change in the amount of virus in the bloodstream or an interaction between cannabis and the immune system because there was this suggestion that it's related to the immune system that may lead to a change in the HIV RNA in the bloodstream. This was a 25-day inpatient study in our General Clinical Research Center. We enrolled 67 people, and we ultimately analyzed 62 who completed the study. We had three arms. We had a group smoking the government's finest 3.6% THC. 
THC cigarette three times a day, a group that took dronabinol 2.5 milligrams three times a day, and a group that took a dronabinol placebo. The primary endpoint was change in viral load over 21 days of exposure to the study, sub, study drug, and you can see that there was no change. Other things we looked at were change in the CD4 cells, the cells, as you know, that become destroyed by HIV. And in a three-week period, both the marijuana and the dronabinol subjects increased their CD4 cells by about 28 to 29 cells, where in the placebo group, they only increased one cell. The difference at 21 days was not statistically significant between 1 and 29, but if we did a so-called repeated measures analysis where we looked at data that also came on day 7 and 15 uh, and 21, then we had, or 7 and 15, then those differences were statistically significant. The CD8 cytotoxic suppressor cells, which fight viral infections, were clearly increased in the marijuana group compared to placebo, uh, but not in the dronabinol group. And actually, the dronabinol people were interested in using our data uh, to go back to get a different indication for dronabinol because this study showed that compared to placebo, the dronabinol recipients gained 3.2 kilograms in 21 days, whereas the placebo group gained 1.1 and the marijuana smokers uh, gained 3 kilos. So clearly, uh, the cannabis did lead uh, to weight gain in these patients. The study, however, was not powered for weight gain as an endpoint, so it was too small uh, for them to take. <clears throat> so there's only so much safety studies of cannabis that you can do before you really want to study does it work for anything because the opponents of cannabis still to this day say there's no evidence that it has any medical benefit for any condition, hence it remains Schedule 1 instead of being in any other schedule. Now, you have to think back to the days when California had a surplus in the budget. And Senator John Vasconcellos uh, suggested that $3 million a year for three years be put aside to study the medical use of marijuana as a medicine. And established was the University of California Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research, the CMCR, which was basically there to fund clinical trials looking at the effectiveness of smoked marijuana. NIDA worked out a deal that as long as they weren't funding the research, and because they are the only legal source of marijuana, they would provide marijuana for studies that were favorably peer-reviewed and that the CMCR said that they would support. So the first study that, that our group did, and all of our studies are done at San Francisco General Hospital, which is a hospital very similar to this one, uh, where we do have a general clinical research center and inpatient unit. Uh, the, the study that we did after our safety study, where we demonstrated that we could safely give HIV patients on protease inhibitors uh, cannabis without disrupting their pharmacokinetics or their viral load, we knew that HIV neuropathic pain was difficult to treat. Patients told us that marijuana seemed to have some benefit, and there was some evidence in a preclinical animal model of peripheral neuropathy that cannabis may be effective. The preclinical model is the, the rat tail, uh, the hot plate test. You put a rat's tail on a hot plate and how long it can stay there uh, sort of is a marker for uh, neuropathic pain. So they found that uh, rats could keep their tails longer on the hot plate when they're exposed uh, to cannabis. So we decided to do a more human type traditional study that was ultimately published in neurology in 2007 uh, this was a randomized placebo-controlled trial of cannabis in patients with painful HIV-associated sensory neuropathy. First, we did a 16-patient uh, pilot study to assess uh, what the magnitude of the effect might be so that we could calculate our sample size, and the required sample size we needed uh, was 50, and you can see uh, that's what we uh, wound up with at the end of the, the trial. In addition to asking patients in the study how their neuropathic pain was, we felt that we needed to be fairly elegant and also include an experimental pain model. We knew that uh, people that were concerned about the study would say, gee, you can't really blind cannabis. People are going to know whether they're smoking cannabis or placebo, and you're going to have 
only people who are marijuana activists are going to participate in the study and they're all going to say if they think they got marijuana that their neuropathic pain is better and if they think they're getting placebo that it's not. So we did an experimental pain model. Uh, Michael Robotham and Karin Peterson from our pain, pain clinical research center at UCSF uh, use this model for evaluating opioids. You heat the skin uh, for 30 minutes to uh, 40 degrees Celsius and it creates a rectangle of erythema on top of which then you rub capsaicin cream. And this creates an area of hypesthesia and allodynia around this rectangle which you measure out with the patient looking over here. You use a brush or a foam pad and you ask them where it changes. So it's very much uh, objective and not at all subjective. And we measure before and after smoking the area of hypesthesia and allodynia. So this was a five-day study that had a two-day lead-in. Patients needed to have a pain score above 40 out of 100. They came in at 60. After the two-day lead-in, being off their feet, not doing stuff around their house, their pain dropped a little. Uh, but after smoking uh, the cannabis, you can see our endpoint was the percent of patients whose pain is reduced greater than 30%. Uh, because my pain colleagues feel that 30% is a good threshold. And you can see that the pain uh, was, this is the placebo group and this is the cannabis group and we had a significant reduction uh, in pain. And these are the, uh, also looking at the uh, areas in the experimental pain model, uh, the placebo group didn't change and the cannabis group uh, did. So we had correlation between the experimental pain model and the patient's chronic neuropathic pain, uh, which led us to conclude then that smoked cannabis is an effective treatment in patients with painful HIV-related peripheral neuropathy, also effective in attenuating the central sensitization produced by standardized experimental pain. And <clears throat> in fact, when we calculated the number needed to treat, uh, the number needed to treat was about 3.6. 3.6 people needed to be treated to get one to have a response. That's the same as gabapentin in HIV neuropathy. Now, we didn't compare gabapentin to smoke marijuana in this study, but from other studies of gabapentin, the magnitude of this pain reduction is similar uh, to what's seen in this current standard of care. Uh, Todd McCurria, who uh, just died earlier uh, last year, uh, took all these pictures of old uh, cannabis therapies and after we published uh, the neuro neuropathy paper in neurology, sent me this slide and said, thank you for reinventing uh, what we've known for a hundred years that cannabis is useful in neuropathic pains. <coughs> Cannabinoids in pain are probably what, what we're, I told you what the endocannabinoids are to help us forget and Michael Pollan in his a second book he wrote, The Omnivore's Dilemma, describes sort of being a hunter and going out hunting for an animal and how he stands very still, hold the gun in this awkward position and develop all these pains and postulates that animals that are predators, that's probably why they have endocannabinoids so they can hunt effectively and forget that they have pain. So there is this link between the analgesic system and the cannabinoids and elevated levels of the CB1 receptor like the opioid receptor are found in areas of the brain that modulate processing of noxious stimuli. We also think that the CB1 and CB2 agonists have peripheral analgesic actions and cannabinoids may also have anti-inflammatory effects. The analgesic effects of cannabinoids are not blocked by opioid antagonists. So they have different pathways. Cannabinoids interact with the kappa opioid system in production of pain relief. The analgesic effects of opioids are mediated by other receptors, but they may be enhanced by the cannabinoid effects. In mice and rats, THC greatly enhances the analgesic effects of opioids in a synergistic fashion, so more than additive. So there is a possibility that cannabis can allow patients on opioids to take opioids for longer periods of time at a lower dose. <clears throat> so, currently we're doing a study, uh, which we're just about to finish, 
uh, where we're evaluating cannabis on blood levels of prescribed opioids. We're enrolling patients with uh, pain who are taking MS Contin or OxyContin, and we're evaluating the impact of five days of cannabis on the levels of the opioids in their bloodstream. Now again, this is NIDA funded. So you would think that what I really want to know is the impact on their pain, but it's NIDA funded. So I cannot study the beneficial effects. So I'm just doing an interaction, a pharmacokinetic interaction like my first NIDA funded study. Now unfortunately, now that I know a little bit more, I may not see a change in the plasma opioid levels because the action might be intracellular. But I'm doing pharmacokinetic. But I'm also asking these patients as they're in our GCRC, hey, how's your pain today? And it's very dramatic. And again, you can't read this too well, but this is cannabis and morphine in one of these sharpened dome products, which I think it's poison because it actually has chocolate in it. That's probably why they call it poison. So as an oncologist, the symptoms that I have to deal with in my cancer patients are numerous and well known to all of you. Weight loss, cachexia, early satiety, anorexia, moderate to severe pain, anxiety or depression, and nausea and vomiting. Now, in the 70s, Jimmy Carter was president and, and he was a bit lax, as they say, on drugs compared to some of the people that have followed. And young people in the 70s got cancer, unfortunately, you know, if they got Hodgkin's disease and they were smoking marijuana. And their oncologist only had compazine to prescribe for nausea. We didn't have what we have today in our armamentarium. And that's how we learned that cannabis is a useful antiemetic for patients taking chemotherapy through anecdote. But in randomized trials, oral THC was found to be better than placebo and equivalent or superior to a compazine. Smoke THC appeared superior to oral. But I think if we had a lime up now, we would say that certainly our serotonin uh, antagonists are the most effective. But they don't work for everybody. And so it's good to have other agents <coughs> in, our, in our toolbox. Now, Rick Doblin, who I mentioned earlier, actually published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology in 1991 a survey that he did of members of the American Society of Clinical Oncology at which time in 1990, 44% had recommended marijuana to at least one patient. And marijuana was believed to be more effective than dronabinol by 44% of these oncologists, dronabinol more effective than marijuana by 13%. So again, <clears throat> in palliative care, weight loss, anorexia, nausea and vomiting, of, of the antiemetics, only cannabis also increases appetite. Granicitron does not increase appetite on Vancitron, metoclopramide, they don't. Moderate to severe pain, anxiety, depression, these are all symptoms. In my work in integrative oncology at the Osher Center, I see mainly patients in consultation who are being cared for by another oncologist, but they say, you know, my oncologist has never mentioned to me that maybe cannabis would be of use. So I find myself writing many letters and when I go to these marijuana meetings where there's a bunch of basic scientists or people working with animals, they always describe euphoria as an adverse event or a side effect. And, you know, I'm not sure it's an adverse experience, especially for a terminal patient. So a single treatment that increases appetite, decreases nausea and vomiting, relieves pain, improves mood, certainly I believe is a potentially useful tool in palliative medicine. Now, even more importantly, so I have a new book coming out. I won't, I won't uh, try to be too gross, but uh, March 9th, uh, Donald Abrams and Andrew Wiles' Integrative Oncology uh, will be published by Oxford University Press. And there are 30 chapters, and Andrew wrote the first chapter, Why Integrative Oncology? <clears throat> and I wrote the chapter, Cannabis and Cancer, uh, which follows a huge chapter on botanicals in cancer. And I wrote it with Manuel Guzman, who is the uh, PhD in Madrid that I mentioned, who studies the basic science of cannabino cannabinoids and their anti-cancer effect. Because there is an increasing body of preclinical evidence that 
cannabinoids may have anti-cancer activity. There are also antioxidants and anti-inflammatory agents in the plant, the terpenoids and flavonoids. <clears throat> there's a suggestion that there's anti-tumor activity by way of the cannabinoid receptors inducing apoptosis and impairing tumor vascularization. Skin tumors and gliomas seem responsive in animal models, but actually if you give nude mice tumor xenografts, cannabinoid curves the growth of lung cancer, thyroid, lymphoma, skin cancer, and gliomas. So again, it's preclinical, but it's very exciting. Cannabinoids appear to induce apoptosis in the gliomas. Cannabinoid administration in mouse models differentiates tumor vascular hyperplasia, so it's probably associated with reduced expression of VEGF and VEGF receptors, which is what avastin or bevacizumab is doing. Cannabinoids also appear to decrease the activity of matrix metalloprotein 2, which uh, uh, regulates the invasiveness of tumors and their tendency uh, to metastasize. So, you know, it's the, this research was originally done in the United States in the 70s, but has been, no, nobody gets funded to do it anymore. So this research is all being done in Italy and Spain, and they are at the forefront. What about the safety? of cannabis. People are concerned. There have never been a death reported from an overdose of cannabis. It's estimated that one would have to smoke 800 cigarettes. I think it's in 15 minutes uh, to kill. And death would be secondary to carbon monoxide and not cannabinoids. By comparison, it would take 300 mLs of vodka or 60 milligrams of nicotine uh, to produce a lethal effect. And the reason that there aren't any overdoses is because unlike opioid receptors, the brainstem uh, which regulates respiration and other vital function, does not have cannabinoid receptors. They're in the cerebellum and the limbic system. The addictive potential and minor withdrawal syndrome of cannabis are less than or equal to caffeine. And then we worry about the risk of cancer. Donald Tashkin at UCLA has made his career for the past 40 years studying pulmonary side effects of cannabis. He shows that alveolar macrophages get black and that patients may be at risk for chronic bronchitis. He also shows that cigarette smokers who smoke cannabis have a reduced risk of COPD. He finally published his shocking piece de resistance. I don't think this is the effect that they were expecting. They looked at 1,263 aerodigestive malignancies, so head and neck and lung cancer, in the Los Angeles basin. So you always have your confounding smog here is an issue, but they did a case control study and they found that people who were regular cannabis smokers had a 26% reduced risk of lung cancer compared to people who don't smoke. How is it possible? Anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and the anti-tumor effects. That, that telling people that would be like saying that the earth is a triangle had there not been had there not been two prior studies that supported it or made it less shocking to me. Number one was the government's NTP, National Toxicology Program, did a study in rats and mice where they fed them increasing dosages of THC via gavage and sacrificed them after two years. What they found was that the animals in a dose-dependent fashion that got the higher dosages lived longer and had fewer tumors, both benign and malignant, than the animals who didn't. One of my medical school classmates, Steve Sidney from Kaiser, Northern California, looked at Kaiser Permanente uh, enrollees uh, and divided them into four different groups. Never smoked cannabis or tobacco, only tobacco, only cannabis, or both. And these were men aged 29 to 44, and they were followed for 10 years, 5,000 people in each of those four cells. So you have 50,000 patient years of follow-up in each of those four cells. In the group that never smoked at the end of 10 years, there were two cases of lung cancer. In the group that smoked tobacco with or without cannabis, there were a 13-fold increase in the risk of lung cancer. In the group that only smoked cannabis, there were no cases. So the control group that didn't smoke anything had two cases. The other group had no cases. Intriguing. The Institute of Medicine, as I mentioned in their last uh, report, said that the accumulated data indicated potential therapeutic value 
for cannabinoid drugs in pain relief, control of nausea and vomiting, and appetite stimulation. And they say the effects of THC are best established. Well, that's because they don't let you study the effects of marijuana. And they say that the effects of cannabinoids are generally modest. Usually there are more effective medications. Just like I mentioned, as an anti-emetic, you know, I prefer, God forbid, to have granitatron or ondansetron. But I believe it was uh, Melissa Etheridge who just uh, was treated for breast cancer and said she never could have gotten through her chemotherapy uh, without having the availability of marijuana. So the Institute of Medicine report said the goal of clinical trials of smoke marijuana would not be to develop it as a licensed drug, but as a first step towards the development of non-smoke rapid onset cannabinoid delivery systems. So they recommend clinical trials of cannabinoid drugs with the goals of developing a rapid onset reliable and safe delivery system. So this led uh, to another study that we did funded by the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research investigating the so-called volcano vaporizer. The device was uh, the product of a German medical device manufacturer. Uh, it's basically a heating element and a fan. And this is a turkey roasting bag, uh, which is put on the end of this one-way valve. The cannabis is put on top of this chamber and the fan inflates the bag with cannabis vapors. So in, instead of combusting plant material, what we're doing is vaporizing it and collecting the vapors in the bag. So uh, it's felt that the vapors are cooler, purer, and probably less toxic than smoke. So we did the easiest study I have ever done in my life to enroll 25 to 40 year old healthy cannabis smokers. <laughs> and they were admitted to our GCRC for six days and they got $500. And each day they got either, they got a half of one of three dose strength NIDA cigarettes to either smoke or vaporize. And that was an easy study. <laughs> and the, uh, <clears throat> the results are shown here. We looked at 1.7% THC, 3.4, and the high test, 6.8% THC. And you can see smoking and vaporization, the THC in the blood was exactly the same. We looked at expired carbon monoxide, which is a marker of, of noxious gases. And in the uh, vaporizer group, they were flat. And in the smoke group, they went up and came down. So less exposure to noxic gases. One thing that almost didn't get the paper published was we asked the patients to rate their high and one of the reviewers wanted to know what the absolute values standard was that I used to valid validate this scale for high. I mean, how do you answer that question? <laughs> anyway, you can see that the, the neuropsychiatric effect was similar in the two groups. <clears throat> so we concluded that vaporization of cannabis is safe and effective Plasma THC levels are comparable, physiologic effects are comparable, expired carbon monoxide is decreased. And that's why in our current <clears throat> opioid cannabinoid interaction study, we're not looking at smoked cannabis, we're looking at vaporized cannabis. Because we do know that people do believe that smoking a medicine is not right. Now let me just remind you about the law as it's been in California for now 13 years and what our rights are and our our protections are as physicians. The law allows for right to possess and cultivate marijuana for medical purposes where medical use has been deemed appropriate and recommended by a physician. It's for use in treatment of cancer, anorexia, AIDS, spasticity, glaucoma, arthritis, migraine, or any other illness for which marijuana provides relief. So huge. I was actually sent to meet with Elliot Spitzer when he was Attorney General of New York before he got impeached or whatever for being governor. And Elliot Spitzer, New York's legislation was going to make medical marijuana available to terminal patients who had no other options. I said, that seems a little draconian to me. Just to remind you, since we, you know, we just celebrated the inauguration, I dragged up some of these old statistics. Yes, we do live in two states, Northern and Southern California, but, <laughs> but you know, even y'all down here passed it uh, with over 50%. But in San Francisco, in that year, we had more people voting for medical marijuana than the president. Uh, <laughs> however, this year, it would have, Obama had 84% of San Francisco. So, The Medical Board of California in their action report said, the intent of the board at this time is to reassure physicians that if they use the same proper care 
in recommending medical marijuana to their patients as they would any other medication or treatment, their activity will be viewed by the medical board just as any other appropriate medical intervention. Accepted standards should be followed as when recommendation, recommending any medication. So do a history and a physical, uh, send patients for consultation as, as necessary, and keep proper uh, records. And they said in this report, if physicians use the same care in recommending medical marijuana to patients as they would recommending or approving any other medication or prescription drug, they have nothing to fear from the medical board. Next line though, although it could trigger a federal action. <laughs> so that is not going to happen. If you, as a primary care provider, discuss with your patient that they may benefit from the use of cannabis and say that you will continue to follow them if they choose to use it. That's all. And the, the one thing that is still a bit bizarre about this law is that you can then not tell a patient where to get it because that's considered aiding and abetting. So that's the key thing that we need to remember. Nobody's gonna go after a resident at a hospital like this writing a letter saying that you will continue to follow a patient in your practice should they choose to use cannabis. And you are denying people an effective medicine if you refuse to write those letters. But you don't know how to dose it. Well, patients are gonna figure out the right dose. Dosing of any botanical is always complex because the plant products vary in their potency, containing very amounts of, varying amounts of the psychoactive or the medicinally active components. And it's difficult to standardize a dose of an inhaled medicine. For our clinical trials, we use the Fulton puff procedure. And we have them inhale for five seconds, hold for 10, and then wait for 45 before they resume. That's just so we can get a standardized delivery. And then there are individual variation in response to smoking cannabis. Some of it is set and setting. Some of it is prior experience. And I bet you we're gonna find out in the future that pharmacogenomics are also going to be a major influence on how people tolerate cannabis. Multiple variables dictate that dosing will be highly individualized. Patient determined self-dosing model is recommended. A self-titration model is acceptable in view of the plant and host variables and the low toxicity of cannabis. Gabapentin, which I already mentioned, is another example of a drug with relatively low toxicity, probably more than cannabis, but high dosing limits. We start patients with one 300 milligrams three times a day and say, crank it up until you're taking three three times a day or even four three times a day. So we do have this sort of vague dosing. Now just in ending a little bit more with some you know, socioeconomics and politics. Uh, I was treadmilling at the gym a few years ago and Lou Dobbs did one of those quick votes. Do you believe the federal government should prosecute doctors who prescribe medical marijuana? And the next day I went on the CNN online and I found the answer was 92% said no. And this is consistent with nat national surveys that found earlier that 75% of the respondents believe patients should have access to marijuana for medical purposes. And that's the same in surveys of physicians. Also, three quarters believe that patients should have access. If you've gone to change.com or org, I forget which it is, apparently when you're supposed to rank what you think the biggest issues for the administration are, out of the top five, number one and four were related to medical marijuana. And the first was that marijuana should just be legalized. This is what the number one you know, advice to the Obama administration was. Now this came from the Bulletin of Cannabis Reform and it, it, it provides data that I think very few people realize that cannabis is our number one cash crop in this country. And the amount of resources that are wasted by having it be an underground market are incredible. And the amount of tax money that we don't have because we're not taxing it is also quite astounding. So making cannabis a legal substance in this country, either as a medicine or just biting the bullet and realizing that it is much less toxic than alcohol and tobacco, you know, look at what we could be doing right now. So, you know, this is the year I graduated from high school. This Life magazine came out. Actually, I'm sorry, it was the year after. October 31st, 1969. Marijuana, at least 12 million Americans have now tried it. Are penalties too severe? Should it be legalized? 
<clears throat> the next president, however, was Nixon. And you know he recorded everything he ever said, so this is from Nixon himself. <clears throat> My uh, reason for continuing to be involved in the study of medical marijuana is I believe that the history of medicine suggests that in these days of genomic medicine and nanotechnology that really to be grounded we do need to return to our roots. And with that I'll say thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> questions? Nothing. Yes. Thank you. Yes. People who chronically smoke uh, tend to need to smoke more to get uh, an effect. I would say yes. Yes. Are there any um, studies out showing uh, drug interactions with prescription medications and cannabis to account there? I haven't been able to find them. Yeah, well, I mean, I did the one on protease inhibitors and we're doing the one on opioids now, but there are, you know, there's really a disincentive for people to study cannabis because uh, it's very hard to do. And even if you do an elegant, nice study, it's very hard to get it published. So number one is getting the cannabis. Number two is designing it so that it's a, a doable study. And number three uh, is getting it published. But, you know, there are others besides ours uh, that are out there. What particular drug are you thinking of? Yeah. 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 You know, I doubt that there would be any significant interaction personally. Yes. Are there any samples of letters that doctors can write for the medical marijuana use that are charged for medical? Yeah, I, I'd be happy to, you know, send one to Rolando if you wanted to, you know, just the one I use. Never got me in trouble. The Society for Cannabis Clinicians, he said, also has some information. Good. All right. Happy New Year, Mr.